thing. There we go. Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome back for week seven of the HEO Development Webinar Series. Uh, we are thrilled tonight to have Dave Stathos with us. Um, I'll let Dave give a little bit more deep dive into his bio and background. He's got a, a, a very extensive background in the world of goaltending and the game of hockey in general. But Dave is one of our leading goaltending instructors with the branch, uh, does a lot of coach development clinics on the goaltending side of the program. Um, and it's great that, that we have him have him here tonight to talk about an area that we have not yet covered, uh, but one that is very, very important to all of our teams. Um, so with no further ado, Dave, welcome, and thanks for presenting tonight, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Brian, and uh, thanks for, for the opportunity to be able to, to do this webinar. Uh, thanks to uh, everybody that's uh, signed in tonight. I think we have about, supposed to have over 100 people signed in for this, uh, this webinar, so uh, thank you very much for joining in. Uh, pretty long title, uh, 10 Strategies Coaches Should Use to Maximize their goalie's development without having any knowledge of the position. Okay, so uh, pretty common, basically pretty common subjects that I get. Um, a lot of coaches, you know, if you never played the position um, or don't have any family members that played the position, a lot of people are left without knowledge. And if you're the head coach, um, sometimes a little bit difficult for them to maneuver. So we're going to touch on those area. Um, a little bit about me. So, uh, well, I played my minor hockey in Long Bay, Quebec, South Shore, Montreal. Played my junior A uh, three years with the Cornwall Colts in the formerly CJHL, now CCHL. Uh, played four years uh, college hockey at Princeton University, where I studied psychology and uh, goaltending. Um, did my thesis on psychology of goaltending and uh, anxiety. Um, I had a short story uh, Philadelphia Flyer. And uh, then I went to uh, Finland, where I played uh, three years for IFK in uh, Helsinki and Sweden. Uh, so I've been coaching for over 25 years. I'm also a full-time teacher with the Ottawa Carleton District School Board, where I teach um, French immersion and uh, a lot of phys ed due to my background. Uh, started the Goalie Performance Center in 2015, so it's going to be our sixth year uh, next season. Also the goalie coach for the Canada Lasers um until uh, this year and uh for those who are familiar like we started the october saves goalie challenge uh to raise money for chio and uh, cancer patients uh so if you want information about that uh octobersaves.org and i have a son who's a goalie uh playing for canada minor hockey and i started working with heo since 2016 on the goalie department so uh like Brian says, touch quite many areas. So uh, if you have any questions about that, we can address them later. Also, uh, you have a chat. Uh, if there's any questions uh, during the presentation, I invite you to write your questions in the chat. And Brian, feel free to interrupt me at any time. Sometimes it's easier to just ask a question right away while we're on the subject um, than going back at the end. But there's going to be a question period at the end as well. So uh, let's get this started. Um, there are... This is not a goalie course, okay? Um, there are two, I just to give you some information, there's two levels of goalie courses that we give at HEO. Uh, the first one being level one, uh, it's a basic goalie course for everybody. It could be like goalie dads, um, goalie uh, head coaches, assistant coaches. Uh, you do need to be on a roster to register on a, a Hockey Canada roster. Um, so, and then we have level two, which is more advanced skills and then 10 scoring situations, which is more geared towards uh, goalie coaches. Uh, each of those courses is three hours long, two hour classroom plus one hour on the ice. Uh, they can, they're delivered usually once a month, but we'll see next year what's going to look like with the COVID situation. Um, but we can, we, we used to host them once a month at Richcraft and, uh, they can also be hosted by your minor hockey association um within your your area or your rank so if there's questions about that we can address them later too but just so you know these courses exist but that's not what we're going to do today so these trends 10 strategies that i'm talking about today um it's not a goalie course okay so i'm not going to go into details of goaltending you don't have to know anything about it uh, it's not goaltending 101 and it's not even goaltending for dummies okay so we're even not there yet 
Uh, but you will not need to understand this slide, which is very important. And it's part of the goaltending level one and level two. So this slide talks about um, the five, uh, five step cycle that goalies need to do uh, in order to make a save. Okay, so regardless of your technique, regardless of the technical stuff, uh, all goalies need to, find, to do this. So first they need to find the puck. Okay, so we teach them to, now the side says eyes first. It's also like, you know, head, head first. So head on the puck, find where the puck is. Uh, then your different goalie movements, just number two, getting into position. So you're going to, your shuffles, T push, get into position. Then once you're in, in position, your stance, you're going to establish your depth. Um, and then, you know, then when a shot comes, uh, you're going to have your safe selection. And uh, once you make your save, let's say it's a blocker save, puck control, rebound, send it in a corner, recovery, which means uh, getting back up on your feet or getting to your post, uh, depending on what position or where the puck is. And then you find the puck again. Um, and hopefully in this cycle, you never lose sight of the puck. That's kind of like the goal um, as a goalie. So, you know, like regardless of the technique and, you know, all the details, we can go into those courses. You know, these five steps uh, are consistent across the board for all goalies, uh, whether you're a Dominic Hasek, that's, uh, you know, sprawler or a Carey Price, who's very technical. Uh, they all go through these uh, five, five steps. Uh, I don't think there's any, if there's any questions, just write them. We can go back to this slide, but I'm just going to move on. So that's as technical stuff for goaltending as we're going to get. Um, so, uh, strategy number one, okay, um, plan time between shots. So one of the problems with this cycle, uh, goalies do it in games or try to do it in games. Uh, but in practice, usually there's not enough time between shots for goalies to go through the whole cycle. So if you look at this, find the puck cycle, uh, number one, find the puck, then second movement, three position, four save selection, five puck control, and one find the puck again. Um, usually goalies don't have time to track the puck properly and recover after they make their save. So what I'm talking about, if you watch practice, you watch a goalie, they'll make blocker saves without sometimes like even looking at their blocker, okay, sending the puck in the corner without even looking towards the corner, and then they move on to the next shot right away. So what we're trying to implement and like having good habits in practice is a goalie tracks the puck in and out of their body, which means when they make a save, they make a blocker save, they track the puck all the way into their blocker. So they're looking at their blocker as the puck touches it, the puck goes to the corner, the head is directed to the work towards the corner. And then if the puck is in the corner, the goalie's movement should be to push and recover to, on the post. Okay. So in most practices, if I if I'm at the rink and I'm watching practice, we don't have time to see that. Um, and it's really important because you then you develop like bad habits of just making saves, losing sight of the puck. Okay. So we work a lot uh, in our goalie practices in uh, in terms of like Tracking the puck into the body, even if you make a chest save, your head should come down onto the puck. When you make a pad save, you should track the puck onto your pad, find a, uh, find a rebound, and recover depending on where the rebound is. Um, and then you reset onto your post or to your stance. But coaches will have objections to this because if there are head coaches out there uh, listening right now, they're going to tell me this. I don't want players to stand in line too long because you want to have as many shots as possible on your goalie and you don't want to have one player shooting while the other 15 or 16 are standing in line. Um, I totally understand. Um, here's a couple. So if you're going to have more time between shots, that means you need to put your players somewhere. Um, so one solution is uh, to add players in front of the net. Uh, for screens and rebounds. So you can have, like, you know, after you shoot, like keep one player in front, two players in front, three players in front, and then they get back in line. So you can have more players active in front of the net, which is more, um, which is more realistic. It's pretty much more game situation uh, when you have players in front of the net ready to, to play rebounds. Also, as far as the shooter goes, like it gives them opportunities to find, find screens, find different opportunities to shoot the puck. 
um, without it being like an open shot all the time. Um, you can also make your drills longer just to add more players in it. So add a pass, so add a few pylons just to make your, your path a little bit longer. So you can have maybe like two or three players in movement at the same time. Um, and then, like I said, like space out the shots so that uh, goalies have the time to play the rebound and recover properly. Um, having less shots and more spaced out is not only good for the goalies, it's also good for the players. I don't know how many times, uh, you know, I heard coaches saying like, you want your players to stop in front of the net. Well, if there's shot after shot after shot coming, um, players don't have time to stop in front of the net and play the rebound. So here we're talking about maybe less shots in a practice, but you got to ask yourself, like, do we want really quality shots or we do want as many shots as possible uh, on our goalie? So in my opinion, you're better off, you know, having maybe a less shots on the goalie, have them more spaced out, uh, making sure everybody plays the rebounds, whether it's goalies, forwards, there's people in front of the net tracking uh, and fighting for those rebounds. Um, and then players, like I said, should stop at the net um, and finish the play. Okay, so these good habits will benefit uh, both goalies and players. So really important. Then uh, second uh, strategy. So if you have any questions about the first strategy, just drop uh, the question into the, uh, the chat and uh, Brian can interrupt me at any time. Um, so first was more time between shots and uh, Strategy number two is to vary the shot origin. Um, again, when I look at practices, um, a lot of the shots are coming from the same spot on the ice. And pretty much anybody that knows anything about hockey knows what I'm talking about. Players pretty much coming full speed, um, either from the top of the circle or the hash mark, and uh, you know taking grade A shots. Uh, if you look at the um, little uh, image uh, on the slide, uh, you have your yellow areas, okay, which are your low percentage, uh, you know, scoring percentage. Uh, red is a little bit better, and uh, blue is uh, the, your high scoring uh, percentage. Uh, but usually in the blue area, uh, most of these opportunities are going to be rebounds because you're really close, close to the goalie. So most of them, from what I see, are coming from the high slot area. So if you look at the, the center, uh, the center of the, the red area, uh, that's where most of the shots are coming in practice because players want to score. Uh, they want to have a good opportunity to score. Um, but ask yourself, like in games, how many shots are really coming from there? So um, most shots come from the hash mark, you know, center ice in practice. So I would say like, you know, 90 to 95% of practice is shots from there. And then in a real game situation, you probably have 5% of the shots uh, that are coming from there. Um, so that's kind of a problem because as a goalie, um, your save percentage or your chances to make a save drop significantly when you're, when you're uh, getting a shot from grade A or the high slot area. Um, so basically you end up as a goalie with only two choices. Well, either you're gonna get lit up and uh, you're gonna give up many goals or you're gonna cheat. Um, so you pretty much have two options. Uh, I hated to get lit up when I played, so I cheated. Uh, and most goalies will cheat. And what I mean by cheating is that they will come out a little bit further out, okay? So, you know, if they're like two or three feet outside their crease, it gives them a better chance. Uh, it makes themselves bigger, gives them a better chance uh, to make the save. Uh, but again, that's not very realistic. Uh, you might be able to make more save in practice, but if you can, you get caught like so far out in games, uh, you're not going to be able to move laterally really quick. Um, so it's just creating bad habits. But um, I understand that the problem is like, let's vary where the shots are coming from. Okay. Um, let's have more shots, you know, from, from the corners, have more shots, you know, like players can come into the zone. Uh, and shoot from the outside. And again, if we have people in front of the net, uh, like we talked about in the strategy number one, maybe the goal is not to score on the shot. Maybe the goal is to create a rebound. So you're you're working on, you know, where should you shoot on the goalie to create a rebound? Uh, usually the answer is long side, you know, right above, right above the stick. 
Uh, you can also have your players finish the drill with an attack from behind the net. So instead of going full speed and taking a slap shot from the hash mark on the goalie, put a bunch of pucks behind the net. Player goes behind the net, retrieves the puck, and uh, tries to beat the goalie from behind the net. Um, and then there's other examples. So think about different situations that you would find in a game. Um, I don't know if it's a lack of creativity, but I find usually like, you know, coaches... Uh, some head coaches, you know, will draw the drill, will focus on their player skills, and then let's just finish the drill with a shot. Well, let's try to, you know, like uh, maybe be a little bit more creative, see what's in it for the goalie, try to create different situations and attack and shots from different areas that are not always like the high percentage area uh, for the players. So that's going to create good habits for the players and also for the goalies, and it's going to be more, more game-like, more realistic. Which brings me to... Uh, my third strategy um so the third strategy is to give shooter options um so very often one of the another problem i find with practice is that the shot uh location is going to be very predictable so goalies will know you know if you had three passes going on in zone and the third player ends up with the puck and takes a shot uh usually the, the goalies it's not that they're lazy and they're not going to follow the play. They're just super smart. And they know that if player A passes, passes to B, passes to player C, and then to player D, player D is going to take the shot. So what goalie does is just stands there, lines up with player D, doesn't look at all the passes, doesn't move on the passes, and uh, then just ends up uh, taking the shot after the multiple passes. Um, so if, they, if the goalies know where the shot will come from, um that makes it easy for them to to just basically stand there and uh like face whoever's going to shoot the puck so when you're planning drills you can try to find situations that are unpredictable okay so what i mean by that is like maybe the player has two passing options uh and it's not always the same player uh taking the shot uh so that's one example so then the, the that would force the goalie to you know to follow the puck and get into position not knowing which player will get it um another situation that we 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 try to do sometimes is like uh, especially for your guys coming down the middle like we talked about and taking like shots from the hash mark um you can have either like a, a pylon or a coach standing there and the player has to go quickly from once on like on one side or the other of that obstacle and take a quick shot uh which you know pretty much simulates like having a def defenseman in front of the net um and then like the the shooter using it as a screen. So now the, the shooter has two options going left or right. Uh, another thing I like to use is actually to put a, a net in front of the net. Um, so we put a net at the hash mark and we kind of use it as a screen. So the player coming down um, basically has to deep the net and take a quick shot on one side or the other. Uh, usually it's much, much harder to deep a six by four net uh, than uh, deking a, a small pylon. So. Um, yeah, so that makes it unpredictable. Your goalies will pay more attention, um, and then it forces them to follow the puck and uh, do their movement properly, their lateral movement, and follow the puck all the way in. Um, strategy number four. Here we go. Uh, let goalies skate and stick handle, and this is uh, this is something that we don't. I don't think we realize enough. And uh, very often, uh, you know, goalies are left aside when players are skating or doing skills or you have a skills coaches or skills teams coming in uh, to do skating and stick handling or any kind of skills. Very often, like goalies are either left out or they're doing something else or sometimes if they're lucky, they're working with a goalie coach, which is fine. Uh, but if you're going to have your goalies not there or stretch, uh, you know, incorporate them into, into the, the team skating. So, you know, they should be able to, to skate as a player. Um, they should be able to, you know, stick handle, make passes, toe drag. These things are kind of fun and will we'll, we'll improve, um, you know, we'll improve their stick handling and hand-eye coordination. Um, so let them work on these skills as much as possible. Incorporate them with players. And um, these skills, like, will pay off later. OK, especially like when uh, I don't know what's going to happen next year, but, you know, like in the last last years, like uh, when you hit 
first year Bantam and there's uh, there's body checking. Um, your defenseman will be very appreciative uh, that you know the goalie goes behind the net and plays the pucks. I put their playing pucks. Playing the puck saves lives. Uh, so anybody that played the played defense at a pretty high level or even like you know at the competitive level uh, will see that uh, you know like being a defenseman and having your goalie um, not retrieve the puck behind the net and letting you letting you uh, go back there full speed uh, is not always uh, enjoyable. So the more goalies can do it, the more efficient they're going to get. Um, which is going to be a super, super uh, helpful skill later on. Um, so now you start, the goalies have to develop the skating and the stick handling skills in order to uh, stop the puck behind the net, which is strategy number five. Um, so I, I put it in two different steps. So the first step is, of course, you need to have the skills, you need to be able to skate. Um, so when you start uh, going to, play the puck behind the net, goalies should just stop it and leave it, okay? Um, especially at a younger age where you don't, maybe you don't have the muscle strength uh, to shoot it or pass it hard. Uh, just start by, you know, skating properly, skating quickly, going behind the net, stopping it and leaving it for the defenseman. Um, communications like with the defenseman and, you know, telling defenseman like, watch out, take your time. All these communications uh, should happen as early as possible, like even in novice. And now that kids don't have mouth guards in their mouth, uh, they should be able to communicate with their defensemen. Um, so yeah, first step, stop it and leave it, that's it. So maybe like your first year that you're able to go behind the net, uh, you know, stick with that and that's very good. And the second step, uh, start to play the puck to your defense in the corners, okay? So then you have an understanding with your defense that if you go and stop the puck behind the net, you're gonna pass it to them. Obviously it takes a little bit more power uh, you know, you need to be able to stick handle properly to be able to, you know, sometimes like make a straight pass or uh, bank it off the board and get it to your defenseman under pressure. Because, you know, when every time you go behind the net, there's there's going to be players coming at you, um, which might be uh, something that causes uh, heart attacks for uh, for for head coaches. Um, yeah. But that's part of the game. And the step three, play the puck uh, to forwards. So, you know, like now when you get a little bit more strength, you can play the puck, understand, uh, you know, how the other team is going to forecheck and kind of uh, have more like team strategies where like you're going to have different options and things like that um, to play the puck. Um, so it's never too early to start, um, you know, making passes. Obviously, it starts in practice. So, you know, as much as possible, like let goalies play the puck in practice. Uh, I know sometimes I hear from coaches, well, I don't want the goalie to go behind the net because he's going to mess up my drill. Um, well, that's, like I guess that's part of the game and goalies will make mistakes. Um, and, but we have to ask yourself, um, you know, we're, we're trying to do a development. And this is a skill that, you know, when, when we hit, uh, when we coach goalies, you know, at the junior age or even throws, um, I was just in web meetings with NHL coaches last week. And like, this is a skill that goalies really are, are lacking. Um, you know, like it's a skill that they, they start developing way too late. Uh, and one of the reasons is that, you know, like as coaches, we don't want them to make mistakes behind the net. And we just like try to keep them in the net and we just procrastinate their development in terms of stick handling, in terms of forecheck understanding. So as much as possible, um, you know, have them play the puck, uh, make it part of your drill. Okay, so make it part of your drill that the goalie has to stay, uh, that has to go behind the net, stop the puck, you know, initiate the breakout, things like that. It's gonna pay off later. And don't worry, if the if the goalie is going to make if the goalie makes a mistake that's fine just maybe keep in keep in mind the pros and cons so like you know like how many times you're able to get out of your zone quickly and not create opportunities in your zone because the goalie played the puck versus just seeing like when the goalie messed up behind the net that cost us a shot on goal or to be stuck in our zone so really understand you know like have a broad broad view of you know what it's going to benefit what it's going to bring uh, for your goalie to play the puck behind the net. And I'm telling you right now, there's going to be more benefits um, than disadvantages. So, And also, um, 
as if you have a goalie son or you know um daughter uh these uh, little three on three leagues four on four leagues are a great opportunity to play the puck uh you know there's a little bit more room uh, there's less whistles and i think that uh, i know my son played the you know four on four league and i was you know first thing i told him is like the only reason i'm putting you four on four is i want you to play the puck as much as possible i want you to go in the corner i want you to get caught i want you to understand how much time you have and you will make mistakes and you will get scored on. And that's the whole point. Like you're going to learn from your mistakes in the long run. That's, that's going to pay off. So ask yourself the question, do I stay in my net to win my little four on four game? Or do I want to risk things, be aggressive, play the puck, learn, and then understand, um, you know, different things like how much time I have, where I should play the puck, uh, be able to communicate with your teammates, these are all like super, super important things. Um, doing with time, 7.30. Okay, we're good. Um, on the psychology side of goaltending, which is kind of uh, my, my specialty and what I studied, um, I'm going to say this. So recognize the goalie's efforts and not the results. And this is kind of a hard thing to do. Um, as much in a positive way that it is in a, we can do it in a negative way. So is what I mean. A result-oriented goalie will experience many ups and downs. Okay, so like when you when you win, you feel like you're you know really high, and you know when you're when you lose, you always feel like it might be your fault, or you know everything is is blown out of proportion for goalies because of your responsibility on the team. Um, you know, especially when you lose because. Um, you always had control, like you're the one that gave up the goals. Um, so very often like wins, uh, blown out of proportion, um, shutouts also, like most often, like the shutouts I've seen, uh, you know, in minor hockey are not often like 60 save shutouts where you stole the game by yourself. Uh, very often, like the, the shutouts that I see, um, are goalies that get, you know, five or six shots and, uh, don't get much action. And then, you know, their shutout gets blown out of proportion. And then uh, they go into another game where they get peppered with 40 shots and they lose. And then they see this as a negative thing. Um, so I'm just saying like, you know, focus on the effort and not on the results. Um, so the more we blow wins and uh, positive things out of proportions, the more, you know, goalies will, will the higher they get, the lower they will get when they're low. So it's uh, super important to, focus on the process rather than the performance or results. Um, and that will keep like everybody, but especially the goalies leveled and grounded. Um, so process goals could be, you know, things like controlling your rebounds. So go into a game and I, you know, as a coach, you can communicate to your goalie. I want you to control your rebounds today uh, or talk to your defense or freeze the puck. Uh, so these are all examples and we, we do that at the, even at a junior level, like we're, we know we're, we're focused on these goals and we rate, we the goalies after games rank themselves, you know, from one to 10, how did you do like on controlling your rebounds, communicating with defense, freezing the puck. Uh, these are all criteria that, uh, anyway, the goalies I work with, um, they they do a self-evaluation where we broke, break down these these games into different process goals. Um, because like these goals, you know, the process goals are more within the goalie's control uh, than the results. Because, uh, you know, we understand that it's a, it's a team game. Uh, very often, you know, a goalie can have a, a great game and play really well, but you didn't get the bounces. And you know what, you lost, you know, 6-2. And, uh, you know, some other games where you didn't play so well, well, you got a lot of key a couple of times. So these, you know, these are all like, you know, things that can happen. And you want to be able to evaluate yourself on something that's consistent and within your control. Okay, mm -hmm. so super important to establish these process goals, and uh, uh, important also to uh, to repeat them to the goalie as a coach or as a parent. Okay, and not give twenty dollars to your goalie for a shutout. Although I'm sure he'd be very happy, but when they lose their shutout, then it becomes a negative thing, and uh, you know, like I said, it's not it's not within their control. Any question there, Brian, so far? Or? 
Uh, we have a few coming in, but um, I, th I think I'll hold them for Q and A. And let you just keep on this roll. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, we're getting some good questions. Good, good. So recognize the efforts, not the result. Strategy number seven: Don't blame your goalie, but hold them accountable. So that's a tricky one. Um, so I wrote uh, that's that's also on the psychological side. Uh, individual that have a specific role, such as a goalie, the ref, the coach, are easier to single out and blame than other positions that are shared by multiple individuals. Okay, so that's why it's easier, much easier to fire an NHL coach than uh, make a bunch of trades. Uh, it's easy to uh, pinpoint a football kicker, um, you know, because he's the only one that has the responsibility on the team. And the more people that do the same role, like forwards, you know, usually you have nine to 12 forwards on a team. Um, you know, it's hard to blame all the forwards at once. Um, so in this way, like goalies have a little bit more responsibility. Um, so I think goalies should feel safe within their team environment and uh, they should never feel like they will be blamed. Uh, you know, when the team is, you know, experiences bad results or loses or is having a rough, you know, rough streak defensively, uh, usually. Um, so as much as you don't want to blame your goalie, uh, this is important also that this principle works both ways. Um, I've seen goalies blame other players. Uh, I've seen, like, there's this, you know, typical saying that, you know, goalie got scored, but uh, five players in front of him need to get beat. Uh, before the goalie gets scored on, uh, you know, that that doesn't take away the goalie's responsibility. Um, you have to look at how, you know, how the goal went in, how how responsible the goalie was. Sometimes they are responsible, you know, like uh, that doesn't mean like you have to blame them. But, you know, goalies make mistakes like everybody else. And, uh, you know, this is this is OK. Um, so the principle works both ways. Um, you never want to see goalies blaming another player. OK. Because as a goalie or as a coach, if you see this, uh, you can be certain that this will come back to the goalie and hound them tenfold. Um, I always tell goalies, like, never blame your defenseman because for each opportunity to you have to blame your defense or blame somebody on your team, they'll have 20 other opportunities to blame you. OK, so as a team, this is never, ever, ever a good thing. Um, you know, and the typical typical thing you see is like you know goalies with their heart, their their arms up in the air, uh, staring at their their teammate because either the the, the player screened them, uh, either the player deflected the puck into in, into their net, or uh, you know like different things like that um, could be also that you know the, sh the player shot the puck in your own net, which uh, I've seen happen, and it happened to me before also. Um, Never a fun thing to happen, but in these situations as a goalie uh, or as a coach, what you want to see is your goalie, you know, going to tap, you know, go tap your defense's pad and say, hey, don't worry about it. We need you. Don't worry about it. This happens, you know, so that when your goalie gives up a bad, bad goal from the red line and goalies out there, it will happen. It happened to me. It happens to every goalie. You can go and watch you know, go on uh, YouTube and watch NHL bloopers, bad goals, highlights. Every single goalie is in there. Okay, it's going to happen to everybody. So you can't control that. It's going to happen to you, guaranteed. What you can control is how you react to it, how you treat your teammates, and then in return, like your your teammates, you know, will will treat you with respect. And they're, you know, when I give up a goal from the red line, uh, I would rather see my teammates come up to me, tap me on the pad and say, hey, hey, don't worry about this. You know, we need you. Refocus. We got you. We got your back. Um, you know, then a goal. Then a, my defenseman, like, turning around and, like, arms up in the air in front of everybody and giving me the stare down. Okay. So we win as a team. We lose as a team. This is a super important mentality that will go a long way for everybody. So it's never, ever productive to blame somebody else um you know so share the responsibility within the team and this is uh kind of like the coach's responsibility to imp implement this uh team thinking 
and also intervene when every time you see somebody blaming somebody else, you need to intervene right away. Uh, and you're going to save yourself a hundred situations like similar down the road. If you intervene every single time uh, you see this and you catch it early. And uh, so that's it for number seven. Don't blame your goalie, but do hold them accountable. Um, number eight, goalies like to be challenged. So challenge them. Um, personally, I'm all, when I coach goalies and I know a lot of goalie coaches that are like me under, understood this idea, um, you need to be in their face because goalies, when they're challenged, they rise up to the challenge. Um, otherwise they wouldn't be goalies. Um, and one interesting fact about goalies is that, um, most of them had to fight or argue with their parents to become goalies. So the fun thing about working with goalies is that um, none of them are there because, you know, their parents push them to be goalies. It's actually the other way around. So uh, they all appreciate the position and they all uh, they all love to play goalie. Um, so in the first sentence there, uh, the game and tournament environment can create high levels of arousals and intensity for players. And even more for goalies due to the greater responsibility. Okay, so the greater exposure, greater responsive responsibilities, things we talked about. So, you know, your highs are going to be pretty high, you know, and the bigger the game, the higher you'll get in terms of intensity and arousal. Um, and then the downfall of that is that could be a big drop in intensity between those situations. And then you go back into practice. So after, for example, after a big tournament that you won or you experience high emotions, um, which goalies experience a bit more, uh, you go back into practice and that can feel kind of boring. So I wrote there like practice can often feel like playing bingo with your grandma after spending a week in Vegas. So not that nothing against uh, grandma actually, but, um, it's, uh, you know, it, it gives you an idea of what it can feel like. Um, so it's super important as coaches, but also as goalies get older, to take that responsibility on their own, uh, to be competitive in practice. Okay. So any situation where you can count goals, count saves, you're competing against another team, um, you know, or you're even when we're doing skating, uh, you know, when you're doing skating with one goalie, they'll go at their own pace. But as soon as you put two goalies, one facing each other, and now they're racing or competing against one another, they'll both, uh, you know, raise their level. So as a coach, you know, as a head coach or as a goalie coach, uh, you know, it's up to us, especially at a young age, to create these little competitive env competitive environments, um, you know, within the practice, uh, see how, you know, you can count different things and making sure um, there's something, you know, in it for goalies. Like, so, for example, like, you know, you can just, go into practice and, um, you know, like um, count how many saves you're going to make in the next 10 shots, for example, and keep track, you know, like I want to, you know, save nine out of 10. And then if you save nine out of 10, you want to save, you know, 10 out of 10 for the next, the, the next 10 shots. And you can break things down like this. Um, the, the one thing that I personally did when I practice, which I, com I continually chirped at my players, and that was on purpose. Um, you know, I was every time I made a save, you know, I was making sure I rubbed it in their face and with a big smile on. And I wanted them to rub it in my face when they scored. And it become it became this super competitive thing where like we became like everybody was communicating with each other. Everybody was raising their game. Everybody was having fun with it. Um, it's nothing negative, uh, especially when you have a good, good team spirit. Um, you know, like, of course, you don't want people to get upset about it. Um, but it's always like, good to challenge each other and put yourself in, you know, competitive situations where, where uh, everybody's going to raise their level and nobody's going to fall asleep during practice or anything like that. So goalies like to be challenged. So challenge them. And then Slide number nine. So to recap so far, uh, plan time between shots. Okay, so like we said, like have enough time for the goalies to make the save 
recover, follow the puck, okay? Vary the shot origin, so where the shots are coming from, so not always from the hash mark, grade A chances, shot, shoot from the side, shoot from the corners, you know, force your goalie to see different shots that are more realistic. Um, number three, give shooter options, okay? So the goalie doesn't predict all the time where the shot's gonna come from or passes where they're gonna go. So have your players have different options so to force a goalie to shot, follow the puck. Um, let your goalie skate and stick handle so that they're able to develop those skills. Uh, number five, let goalies play the puck behind the net as early as possible. Understand that they will make mistakes. That's okay. That's going to pay off later. Okay. We're not trying to, we're not trying to create like great 10 year old goalies. We're trying to create great 20 year old goalies or, you know, older goalies. Uh, number six, appreciate or focus on the effort rather than the results, you know, so that we can control those ups and downs a little bit more and have goalies leveled and grounded. Uh, number seven, don't blame your goalies, but hold them accountable and don't let your goalies blame other players. Number eight, goalies like to be challenged. So do challenge them all the time. You know, I'm pretty sure uh, everybody is very curious about number nine and 10. Number nine, Remember the first eight strategies. And number 10, apply the strategies. So, questions. That resumes uh, my presentation, Brian. So, if there is uh, questions from the chat room, uh, feel free to fire away. We have a lot of questions, my friend. Ooh, we're gonna be here all night. You just you just set a new standard for questions on our webinars. Beauty, I like that. We have eleven questions. Actually, we have more because one particular question came in from four or five different coaches. So, um, so we and and some great questions here. Good. So we'll try to take them in order. I've got them all written down here. Um. You, you covered this in one of your strategies, but I'm going to put it back out to you to maybe just to dig a little bit deeper. Uh, can you discuss just a little bit more on the importance of letting your goalies play the puck at early age? Um, the coach that submitted the question, coaches at a higher level, at a, at a, a, a higher AAA level, um, gets a lot of coaches, goalies that come into his program. Uh, coaches didn't want me playing the puck. They were afraid of me playing the puck, told me not to play the puck, stay in your net. Um, I'll let you just run with that on what some coaches can do with those younger goalies to try to convince them to get out of that blue paint, take the risk, be comfortable with it. You make a mistake. Whoops. You make a mistake. Yeah, no, exactly. And that's, that's very common. I'm going to go back to that slide actually. Uh, yeah. Goalies stop the puck behind the net. Um, first goalies have to be like the goalies have to be able to skate. Okay. If you can't skate, don't go behind the net. I agree. But, then it starts with like, you know, having your goalies do the skating drills in practice, skate like a forward, you know, be able to use your edges just like a forward, like be able to skate out of your stance. Okay. Um, so step number one, goalies should be able to stop the puck and leave it. So as much as, as long as you're able to skate, you know, uh, we're not even talking about stick handling or anything dangerous here. Uh, that will help the team. If some, if the other team dumps the puck in from the right corner, and the puck is rimmed around behind the net, the other team wants the puck to go in the left corner. Okay, so they're rimming it around. So by the goalie stopping the puck behind the net and leaving it there, automatically, that should be a positive thing because the puck didn't end up where the other team wanted it, okay? Second, like, we're not asking the goalie to play the puck in step one. That's not, they're not there yet. All they do is like, stop it, leave it. You know, we teach goalies to leave it off the board so that the defenseman uh, can recover the puck. So in step number one, goalie st goes behind the net, stops the puck, leaves it. If the Ds are doing their job, they should be getting there first. They should have a step on the forwards, okay? So, so far, there should be no, no danger, really. So encourage your goalies to go behind the net. Where, it be, where, be, where there is a danger is when goalies start to play the puck, okay? So we're talking about the goalie stops behind the net, and then he's looking, He's hanging on to the puck. He doesn't know where to pass it. Um, 
you know, and then he kind of fumbles the puck and loses the puck or tries to pass it right across the front of the net. Um, you know, like these are things that obviously you don't want as a coach, but if you want the goalie to be able to make smart decisions in games, he needs to be able or she needs to be able to do those in practice. Uh, very often, you know, like drills don't incorporate goalies in practice in terms of playing the puck, stopping it and making passes. So goalies end up in games, they go behind the net, they don't know where to pass it. And to be honest, it's not rocket science and goalies need that experience. Um, it's not like there's a hundred different options. And if goalies understand where their players are going to be, um, of course, you want the goalies to, you know, be able to see the play. But very often, like, you know, you're going to stop the puck behind the net and your, your default option could be to just put it in the corner, uh, in one of the corners. Okay. Um, yeah. We're not asking to make anything dangerous. Uh, you know, we're not asking to do like, you know, the saucer pass to the red line or even like talk about breakout or playing the puck up ice. Uh, just stop by, start by stop the puck, leave it for your D and get back in the net as quick as you can. I don't see how even like uh, an Adam goalie uh, can have, you know, trouble just focusing on this. We keep it simple. Okay. Um, one of the coaches wanted some thoughts on a strategy they use. Um, when they bring players into the board to discuss the next drill setup, they allow their goalies to do passing, uh, you know, maybe from one net to the other, but they let the goalies just, you know, do some passing back and forth. Um, he was just interested on what your thoughts are on that strategy. Yeah, absolutely. And the more, uh, you know, passing back and forth goalies are going to do the better. Uh, you know, switching from forehand to backhand. So that's another one. Like, so I encourage them. Because very often goalies will go behind the net and stop the puck, and they're facing the board when they stop the puck. So we work a lot on being able to pivot quickly, uh, you know, move your feet. That's where, like, those kind of, like, mohawk turns and turning your feet really quickly uh, to be able to face off high, turn into play. Um, so, yeah, like, you know, passing back and forth and switching from forehand to backhand really quickly will will be very useful and this is kind of like part of the you know the other slide earlier uh, where we just talk about like the skills and the stick handling and these are things that goalies should take responsibility to and being able to practice off the ice i don't know how many times um you know i talk with goalies or i see goalies like they're shooting pucks in their driveway while they're using player stick and player gloves or a goalies asking me, can I take my gloves off for this drill because I'm asking them to make a pass? Uh, no, like that's part of the skills. So if you're a goalie and you're trying to develop those skills, of course you want your coach to integrate you in practice, but also take responsibility, go in your you know garage and you know shoot some pucks, put your gloves on, put your stick on, you know, goalie stick, goalie gloves, and uh, you know, practice goal those skills as much as possible. Excellent. I totally agree with it. Yep. Yeah. Excellent. Um, if you have a, if, if a team has a dedicated goalie coach, is it still a good idea to have those goalies possibly go external for training? Uh, like, what's your thoughts on the single voice versus multiple voices? Um, my my personal opinion is the more voices, the better. Um, you know, like I encourage you know my son with like working with my goalie coaches or, you know, other HEO coaches. Uh, you know, I had probably somewhere between 15 and 20 different goalie coaches. Um, and I understand that, you know, some coaches will contradict each other, which is fine. You know, like ask questions. If you're a goalie, you're, you go see a coach, you know, and something doesn't make sense, talk, talk back and say like, you know, why, what's the purpose? What are the pros and cons? There's no, even when we talk at a high level, you know, with different goalie coaches about different techniques, there's no ultimate perfect technique. Everything has its pros and cons. So it's super important uh, for goalies to ask questions, uh, understand what they're doing. So if a coach asks you to do something, um, ask them, you know, the pros and cons and try it. You, I think goalies should be able to try everything. Like, I think goalies, you know, you should still able, you should still be able to do two pad slides. Like you're, you know, that's part of the, you know, maybe you're not going to use it all the time, um, you know. But if anything, for goalie history, you should be able to do a two pad slide. 
Uh, I think the reason why uh, you don't see it as much anymore is that, you know, it's hard to track the puck, but, you know, it's part of the, the goalie culture and you should be able to do all those moves for sure. So to answer your question, like, see, you know, grab as much as you can from each goalie goal, each goalie coach you encounter. Everybody's going to have their specialty. Everybody's going to see different things, different things they focus on. So instead of like trying to avoid or not listen to one guy or like the other guy is better or like, you know, try to grab a little bit uh, from everybody in every situation. Same thing with your head coaches, like everybody you encounter, try to get the best out of them. And, uh, you know, that's how you you put all your package together. You're an individual like you're an individual goalie. And because you decide to grab different things from different goalie coaches, even if you look at the NHL level, like the, all the goalies in the NHL, no two goalies are the same. They all have different techniques, different styles. And that's a style that their style is not something they grab from a specific coach. It's something they developed by grabbing different skills and techniques and philosophies from different goalie coaches. I can guarantee you that. Yeah. So, Excellent. Yeah. Um, what advice do you have on key points the head coach should discuss for goalie development in practices and expectations for games before and during the season? So repeat the first part, please. I'm French. Yep. So the coach that asked the question is looking for advice on key points that a head coach should discuss for goalie development in practices and key points for expectations in games before and during the season. So is there a distinction? Do they change? Do things before the season change during the season or yeah, I think uh, they, they change a little bit, um, you know, like practice should change also like, you know, beginning of the season, um, you know, like, like more the fundamentals are going to be that are going to be worked on. There's more skills, fundamentals from the goalie perspective and from the team perspective also, uh, you know, you got your skills, getting your legs, uh, you know, all your basic, basic stuff. Then, you know, second part of the season, you're more into like strategies, you know, now that your skills are established, uh, you know, you're, you're, you know, as a, as a head coach or even as a goalie, you're more into strategies, like, you know, like how you're going to play in this situation or that situation. And as a goalie coach, you see how your goalies respond to different situations over a little bit of time. Um, so second phase would be more like strategies. And then your third phase where like you're hitting, you know, your tournaments, your playoffs and this and that. And now it's all about execution, um, you know, and your key points. Not that they're like all they're not like result oriented, like we talked in the slide. Uh, but what I mean by that, that is like just go out there and play, just go out there and have fun, you know, just go out there and push yourself. Uh, show me what you can do. This is your test. You've studied all season. Just like, you know, like at the end of the school year, you're just, you know, showing your skills. Um, you're not doing development as much, you know. Um, you know, the fruits of your labor all season long. So, yeah, I would say three stage. So development, you know, skills development, all the basics. Then you get your strat more strategy. Um, phase middle of the season and then more towards the end is uh you know more execution and let's just you know have fun and your practices towards the end of the season should be like more up tempo more fun you know get a good feeling good atmosphere versus like going into like so specific details whatever you had to coach when it's towards the end of the season you can make small adjustments but if you have key points to coach you, you should have been addressed earlier in the season than towards the end so okay um, a lot of goalie coaches take training, but the goalie coach never sees them in games. What are your thoughts on that? That's a, that's a very good, good point. Um, so as much as possible, like, you know, goalie coaches, but well, technically you can see everything in the same, same way. So, you know, technique wise, you know, you're, you're going to be able to see the same thing, same, uh, um, Goalies will make the same mistakes and things like that. They have the same strength. 
um, in practices and in games. So as a goalie coach, if you only see the goalies uh, in practice, um, you're going to be able to correct technically. Um, what is lacking, and it, for sure goalies, goalie coaches should be able to see as much video or watch games or get feedback on how they played. Um, and then you're going to talk, you're going to start to work with your goalies on, you know, like the development of the seasons and like mental skills and strategies. Um, it's true. Even at, the, even at our goalie center, like we don't have much time uh, during the season. Um, you know, goalies are in and out. They do like, you know, sessions, private sessions, this and that. We don't have much time. We do a little bit on the ice. You know, if there's issues or things like that, we, we talk about it. But mainly, like, we only have time over the summer uh, when we do our goalie camps and we do, like, one-hour classroom uh, to talk about, you know, mental skills and things like that and how to overcome different situations, uh, which is a huge part of the game. As goalies, uh, you know, technically, technique is important. And at a young age, te technique will make the difference. And as you get older and older, Technique is, you know, everybody is good. Everybody's going to be good technically. What's going to make the biggest difference is like how you go, uh, how you see yourself over the course of the season, develop, how you face different situations. Um, you know, are you able to cope, uh, you know, with different situations? And every, every season is different too. Like every team you play on is different. If you play for a good team, you know, where you don't see a lot of shots and you have to stay focused. Uh, and then the next season you play for a weaker team where you're getting peppered and these are all different roles that you have to step into. And I think as a goalie coach, um, you know, you bring your experience and it's, it's very important to be able to do that, you know, um, so as much as possible, like, try to get that information at, le at the very least, like film videos. Um, I know, like, from my perspective, I film a lot of games from the goalies. Uh, from behind the net with the GoPro, uh, we get a suction cup and we kind of stick it behind the net. I don't have any footage, but it's amazing what you see. Like even myself playing senior hockey now, like uh, I teach some stuff and I watch my games and uh, sometimes I don't always do what I'm teaching, but that's uh, another discussion. Um, you had talked about the classic stare. One of the coaches asked, do you have any advice on how to deal with that classic stare? if it happens in a game? Um, yeah, like I would like take the goalie aside after the game. Um, you know, as much as they're responsible for like putting their hands up and putting their, their teammate in a tough situation, like nobody, you know, wants to, you know, get their, be stared at. Um, so what I would do personally, if I would see my goalie do this, uh, you know, I would take them aside uh after the game individually you know so that nobody notices that i'm doing that um you know make them realize you know how they would feel if it was the other way around or even like ask them if it's ever happened to them because most likely as a goalie it, it did happen to them um you know sometimes it's just you know a reflex and they really didn't think about it but if you know goalies have any sense of um, they'll realize that it's, you know, it's, it's not an appropriate thing to do and they wouldn't like it if it was the other way around. And, uh, I'm sure like most goalies will understand, but it's, it needs to be reinforced because, and you can actually reinforce it to that defenseman also after again, in private, you know, say I did talk to the goalie, um, and you know, this is what, you know, we talked about. Just so that the cycle stops, you know, you want to, you know, you pick up on these things and maybe that's the teacher in me, like in the classroom, sometimes you see different scenarios and when you have less experience, you know, you let them go and they, you know, they snowball. Um, but as a coach, you can't let these things go. Uh, it's not to putting people on the spots, but you take them aside, you address it. Uh, you don't embarrass anybody. You talk to the goalie on the side situation is dealt with. He's never going to do it again. You talk to the defenseman that it was done to you make sure that person doesn't do it back to the goalie you can have them talk if you want talk it out um and then you know what i would even like address it with the team after after you've dealt with both individuals address it with the team and say you know that's something i don't want to see you know whether it's on the ice or even on the bench you know blaming each other 
or, uh, you know, having a negative attitude or, you know, blaming your teammate is, is only, you know, you're not helping your team. Um, it's only going to snowball and, you know, as a coach, uh, you need to, the, the earlier you intervene, the better. Okay. Yeah. Any of those situations. For yeah. sure. Um, so young goaltenders, uh, their pregame preparation, and this is the question that came in from a number of the coaches in a variety of ways. So the question gets to the matter of what should young goalies be doing with their pregame preparation for consistency? You see some goalies do, you know, the balls and the, uh, the stance work. You then have some goalies who are a little bit more loose, loosey-goosey. They don't do anything. Is, is there a right answer? Is there a wrong answer? Um, and for a goalie who does want to have a pregame routine, what should that pregame routine be? So sort of a two-parter there, Dave, sort of, you know, should they or shouldn't they? And if they should, what should it look like? Um, well, you'll find that you, you don't want to put pressure on, you know, you know, young kids like, you know, they should have fun. They, you know, goaltending or hockey should be fun. Um, and it will remain fun. Um, but I think like as you, you know, as players mature and kind of like they take on more responsibility, especially on the competitive side, uh, you're going to see, uh, you know, players developing a routine. OK, so to me, it's more like the routine is something you develop individually more than something that you have to do or something you take on or you copy from somebody else. Um, I think it's it's more a matter of like trying different things. So you can try, you know, juggling balls, you can try stretching, you can try, you know, jogging, you can try even like to stay loose and listen to music or some goalies like to chat with their teammates, some goalies rather, you know, uh, not talk at all. Um, try different things and see how it makes you feel. So if you feel like our goal is to be on the ice, when you step on the ice, you should be warmed up. So whether it's practice or games. And that's something that I'm having a conversation often with the like, Canadian coaches. And I see it in Finn. Like when I go to Finland, I see it often. Like I see very young kids, like seven or eight year olds actually like doing warm ups on their own without having any coach there. And it's a different, a little bit different mentality there. But um, anyway, when you step on the ice, you should be warmed up already. Okay. So ice is expensive. And with COVID and the whole situation is going to get even more expensive for player. Um, so step on the ice, make sure you're warmed up, whether it's a practice or a game, you don't have time to spend 10 minutes warming up or stretching on the ice, do that off the ice, stretch off the ice if you need to. And, uh, so pay attention on how you feel. So if you don't feel like warmed up or that you're ready, uh, change your routine. And if some things make you feel good, um, you know, by all means, I can incorporate them in your routine. You don't want to be doing too much. Uh, so that it becomes like stressful and you feel like, you know, uh, if I didn't eat my three bananas before the game, like I'm not going to be able to play. Um, you know, you want to have some flexibility, but also you want to have some some things that are, you know, consistent uh, and are, that are going to be, you know, make you feel good. Like I wouldn't try new foods before a game, for example, you don't have any surprises. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you see different things and look at what other goalies are doing. You know what, like you're, especially when you're, well, whether you're young or older, look at what other play, other goalies are doing as pregame preparation. Maybe try it before practice, before you try it in the game. Uh, there's all kinds of stretching, also like juggling, but also like eye movements where you're tracking, um, converging your eyes, you know, to see objects that are close versus far. Um, all kinds of stuff about, you know, visual, uh, physical and even like mental warm up uh, attention uh, exercises that you can do and uh, you know if if they make you feel feel good and you feel sharp when you're on the ice perfect you know but try different things it's not going to happen overnight and you can't take somebody's warm up or pregame preparation and copy it to yours and just expect that it's going to have the same result because it's not it's something you develop personally just like we talk about Goalies having different techniques, even at the NHL level, like everybody's different. So you need to learn your body, your psyche, and your technique and what you can do. So, gotcha. Do you have any advice for young goaltenders to help them reset after being scored on? 
Yeah, that's one thing we talk about in the in the camps. It's actually pretty funny how like even like um, very young goalies, like even like six, seven year olds, they can have a conversation about you know giving up goals and how it feels and it's not like just water under the bridge and they're really they're really young and they're already having these emotions so imagine um an nhl goalie or like you know at a high level you you develop different things um the main thing to me is having a routine okay so whenever you give up a goal and whether it's a bad one or a good one it's still worth one point on the board um, and you should have a routine of what to do after a goal. Um, there's nothing worse than getting scored on and then you're staring at your teammates. Maybe your defenseman has their arms up in the air staring at you. Uh, but also the other team is celebrating. Maybe your coach is mad. Maybe your parents, uh, you know, there's all kinds of distractions or things that you can pay attention to after you get scored on. And you should replace all these things by just a simple routine. So. For, for me, for example, like the example that I give is like when I got scored on, I went to touch the board. So I would just skate down, I'm obviously on the other side. So usually the, the team that scored is celebrating on the, your right side or your left side. So if they're celebrating on my left side, I just skate down the ice on the right, go touch the board and come back. That takes about 30 seconds. And that was my routine when I got scored on. So. There was no thought process going into it. I wasn't paying attention to anything else. It was an automatic thing. Um, you know, there was no panic. I, I give up a goal. I go touch the board and I come back. There's no emotion attached to it. That's just what I do. So kind of like, you know, like a fireman or a policeman that's, you know, they hear, they hear the call and they know what protocol to follow. So that's kind of like where you want to be as a goalie. So, you know, at the NHL level, they don't, you know, they're so trained, they don't panic. They get scored on, they have a routine, they do it. And then it's just, you know, next time, next thing that happens, the puck drops and you're, you're back in the game. But I do suggest that you find something to do that lasts about 30 seconds, because that's the amount of time you have between the moment you get scored on until they drop the puck again. So also I would suggest try to do something where you're moving. Okay. So like when you're standing still and you're not feeling good and you get, just got scored on, sometimes you can, you know, build like some tension in your muscles. So try to move. Um, and it even got to the point where I had a routine it was different for me. Like I would, whenever my team scored, I also had a routine. So not only when I got scored on, when my team scores and I still do it, like, you know, my, when my team scores, I just go behind the net, touch the board and come back the other way. Okay. So, and the reason for that is like we talked about, you don't want the, the, the highs to get too high and the lows to get too low. So as much as giving up a goal can affect you in a negative way, um, your team scoring goal can affect you in a, in a positive way, but you don't want to get too high. You want to say like, you know, even heal the whole game. So be careful at how much the positive things in the game also affect you and get you too excited and off task. Um, so yeah, like just, you know, routines for everything, uh, are definitely a good idea. And these are, again, like, these are some things you develop, uh, there's no secret recipe, uh, try different things and see, see how they make you feel. And, um, it's part of the process. Cool. Um, question came in about pulling the goaltender. How do you deal with pulling a goalie when and why, and then making sure that the young goaltender's confidence doesn't take a big hit. Yeah. Um, that's, that's a tough one. And there's different situations and different goalies will react differently. Um, in general, like the, my, the rules I would say is like, especially in minor hockey, put the goalie's well being first. Okay. Because the goalie is in that situation. Um, so what I mean by that is, is this goalie going to benefit from staying in the net more than benefit from getting pulled? And sometimes you benefit more from getting pulled. Um, you don't want to end up, you know, on the ice and staying embarrassed and being embarrassed. Um, and you don't want to, um, you know, get pulled and the goalie getting upset. So one thing that I, you know, so far my son is going into Bantam. Uh, minor ban next year and pretty much so far like I advised coach or when I was coaching him like 
I always ask, and there's some times where like we were down by a few goals and I always gave the goalie so far the option, like, do you want to stay in or do you want to get out? And that's usually happens between periods. Um, so between periods is much easier. Um, I also, you can tell the other goalie if there's, well, obviously there's one, if you're going to pull your goalie, uh, there's another one, but it gives it a chance for you to tell the other goalie, you know, get ready. We might switch you, you know, after the end of the period and then ask the other goalie, do you want to stay in or do you want to get out? So by giving the goalie the choice, uh, it will empower them. If they decide to stay in, it will empower them. It's like I made that decision to stay in. I'm going to show my coach. I'm not, they're not a victim anymore because it's their choice. Okay. And same thing. Maybe like the goalie will tell you like, no, like, you know, I'm not feeling good or maybe they are not feeling good. And, um, you know, like there's nothing wrong with getting pulled. Everybody gets pulled at some point or another. Um, and sometimes it's it's the best thing to do for the team, but also for yourself individually. But if you were to pull a goalie um, in the middle of a period, um, I would say go talk to them right away. Um, because when you get pulled and you're, there's no communication, it's, it's not a good feeling. And especially at a young age, you get pulled, you sit on the bench, you feel pretty lonely. You're, you know, your teammates are kind of like, Usually they don't know what to tell you or they're going to be, you know, in, uncomfortable. So as the head coach, pull your goalie, go talk to them, say like, you know, you know, calm down. Maybe either, maybe we're going to get you back in or like get ready for the next game. Like give them something to work with. Don't just like leave them on, in the corner and uh, not talk to them because that then it's not going to be a good situation for sure. Gotcha. If a team has a goalie coach, do you recommend the, the goalies doing their skating work with the goalie coach or blending them in with the players when they do skating? Uh, I would say mix it up. Mix it up? Um, yeah. If you have a goalie coach, um, by all means, like, you know, work with the goalie coach, do your skating, develop your goalie skills. Um, you know, what I mean by incorporating the, the goalies into skating is like sometimes I see – the goalies are the goalies are in their crease like stretching yeah while the players are doing skating or you know different things like that where like you know don't just because it's not your skill well it's, it's going to be eventually at a higher level but what i meant by that is like don't just like go and drink water because the players are skating or goalies get off the ice earlier because the players are skating if you have a goalie coach to work with you can work with the goalie coach but as much as possible when the goalie coach is not there or you know if it's a if it's a team punishment <laughs> sometimes i've seen that if it's a team punishment um you know a little bit of skating because there was a bad performance or something you have to have your goalies in there i don't care how many if you can have 10 goalie coaches on the ice if if, if it's a message like the goalies have to be part of it and goalies are part of the team they'll make you lose games they'll make you win games that's all part of the team and if it's a bag skate, they have to bag skate just like everybody else. Yeah. So. Um, at the younger ages, um, 9, 10, 11, 12, you know, the, the, let's say the novice through to peewee-ish ages, yep. what would you think or what would you consider to be the single most important skill for young goalies in that young age range? The most important skill at that age is skating. Skating? Yeah. Skating, like mobility. Like as you get older, these are things that are really, really hard to catch up with if you didn't if you didn't develop them at a young age. So goalie skating, and I'm not talking about goal like playing the puck behind the neck skating. I'm talking about goalie skating, mobility, uh, developing that leg strength. Um, you know, if your goaltending is in a nutshell, is Am I able to be in position on my feet and set before a shot is coming towards me? So the faster you're skating, the earlier you're going to be able to get set, the more you increase your chances to make the save. As a team against a goalie, your goal is to make the goalie move so he's not ready to make a save, like when the shot comes in. Um, so 
obviously like the, the better skater you are, the more saves you're going to make because you're going to be in better position. Um, and goalies that are not good skaters will get away at a young age. Okay. And here I'm talking about goalies that have way too big pads because maybe their parents or themselves decided like, if I have bigger pads, I have a bigger butterfly and I'm going to stop everything in novice. <laughs> uh, that's true. And I see it every single year and they will be the best goalie in novice and they will just drop on every shot and cover the whole net in their big butterfly or paddle down where the goalies like lays the stick down on the ice. They do a paddle down and they cover the whole bottom of the ice. It will work in novice. You're going to be the best novice goalie in Canada. Um, but you're, you're not working on your skating. Uh, you're not reacting to shots. You're not tracking. You're not making a safe selection. Um, and this will catch up. It will catch up to you like later on. So if you have to choose like properly fitted equipment, so don't go for coverage when you're young because it will, it will, it, it will be a, it will harm them in their skating. If your pads are too big because you want to cover more space, um, it's going to be harder to skate. You're not going to develop as, as good skills. So if anything, properly fitted pads, uh, if they're a bit too small, that's much better than, a, than too big. Okay. Gotcha. So, yeah. Great. Um, last one. Um, how do you suggest layering, layering goalie development into a team season plan? Or should you have a separate goalie development plan? I think you should have both, you know, um, like you, you should have like a, you know, each goalie should have their development plan in terms of like, and that comes probably with, uh, you know, like tryout evaluation or sort out evaluation. Uh, you know, like very often we ask for feedback, you know, or, you know, goalies ask for feedback when they get, they get released or to get cut from a team, but you should ask like, you know, like also when you make the team, like, what was my evaluation? Like, what do I, what are the things I need to work on? What are my strengths? You know, what are my weaknesses? What are the things I need to work on um, over the course of the season as an individual? And then, um, you know, that's your personal goalie plan. And then as a team, uh, you know, like you should have, um, you know, like integrate the goalies into, into like, the the team plan as well and as you get older and older like the, the goalies will take a, a bigger part of the team plan you know when you when you talk about you know play in zone breakouts or like you know when to freeze the puck or like you know what's the role of the goalie on the you know penalty kill or even power play or um you know with your team like how you're going to go about the rotation and like how you're going to play your goalies over the course of the season are you going to rotate every game which seems to be, you know, the fair way to do it. Or are you going to go, um, you know, if we play, uh, if Canada plays Nepean four times in the, over the course of the season, are you going to play each goalie twice against Nepean? So that's another way to do it. So that's, that's all part of the team plan. And also tournaments, uh, you know, some goalie coaches, some goal, some coaches can rotate, you know, each goalie 50, 50, like every game throughout the season. But if you think about it, sometimes it might not work out evenly where, you know, for some reason, coincidence ball, it happens that, you know, the, the same goalie starts every tournament. You might want to switch that up and just make a switch at some point. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's the same goalie is, is, is always like playing in the final of the tournament. Um, you know, so look at the schedule, depending on where things might might happen, um, you know, and how many times you play each team. Look at the schedule. If you rotate 50-50, um, what it's going to look like. And then if you do... Um, you know, if it doesn't look like even, then you can make changes and always be uh, communicating with your goalies. Uh, you know, what's, whatever your plan is, you know, let them know. Um, and that's another thing in the presentation that I haven't touched is like, let your goalies know if, if you're choosing, like uh, let them know who's starting like the night before. I had a coach that uh, sometimes forgot to let us know who's starting and uh, would tell us like at warm after the game warm up when we would just both stare at him and thinking the other one is starting. So <laughs> that's not, not, a, not a good way to go. <laughs> Dave, thank you so much. Uh, tons of valuable information. I, I, what I really liked about it is, is there, there was nothing technical there. 
-hmm. nothing that any of the coaches, uh, myself included, needed to know about how to teach goalies, just some really good, simple, practical things that we can all do in practice to help the goalies just be a little bit better at their craft and, and, and get a little bit more focus uh, when we're working with our teams and practice and our players. So um, thank you very much. Uh, very insightful. Um, thank you again to all the coaches who stopped by uh, and, and participated tonight. Um, just, uh, uh, just a point of clarification for next webinar. We are not on the schedule for next Wednesday. We're breaking stride a little bit. We're going Monday night with Dave Leger. Um, Wednesday night is Canada Day, so we kind of thought we would go ahead of it uh, rather than behind it, but we certainly didn't want to go on Canada Day evening. Um, so we have Dave Leger on deck with us Monday night at 7 o'clock, June 29th. Registration is now open, so uh, if you haven't signed up, uh, please uh, hit up our social media, Twitter and Instagram, uh, or the website, and you'll find the registration link there. Um, so looking forward to, to seeing you all back again next Monday uh, and listening to Dave talk to us about some uh, very interesting topics uh, and some things from his experience and his background. Uh, so again, Dave, uh, thank you very much. And uh, everybody stay safe and healthy, and we'll see you Monday night. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.